Okay, now let's talk about a, a couple studies. The first one is Thakkar, T-H-A-K-K-A-R, 2015. It was published in the journal Alcohol. Um, they found that these scientists found that in healthy non-alcoholics, acute alcohol, so just taking a little alcohol, um, decreased sleep latency. So that's just a fancy way of saying that the people did fall asleep faster than otherwise. However, while they did fall asleep faster than normal, the second half of the night was a much worse sleep. Um, they are they had much less REM sleep and they had much more limb movement. So they were just more agitated and moving their limbs around more like with the restless leg syndrome, although they use a more technical term for it, but they were much more restless. So they had a, a significantly worse sleep in the second half. And then they note that with chronic um, alcohol drinkers or alcoholics, although that's a, that's a maybe too bold of, bold of a term, Chronic alcohol drinkers, whether we would call them alcoholics or not, do experience severe sleep disruption, including uh, an eventual chronic insomnia, which leads them to feel, to feel much sleepier during the day. Um, a second study of many studies that I could show, and indeed there are so many that there are large reviews written about this, including this one by He, H-E et al., 2019, um, that's in the journal Current Opinion in Psychology, and they note that alcohol disrupts sleep ar uh, architecture, which is a fancy way of just saying the normal structure of the sleep, and triggers substantial insomnia and disrupts circadian rhythm, once again disrupting sleep um, and causing daytime sleepiness. Now, the third of the indirect um, uh, effects here is substrate. And you may be wondering why I'm using that word and how I'm using it. So to be a little clearer, what I mean by this is substrate competition. So calorie use, essentially, or nutrient use. So there are the main fuels in the body, the main fuels being glucose and fats. And then we have some sort of secondary fuels, although some may be primary fuels, like ketones, for example. Most people... Um, have very infrequent elevated ketones. So we will call ketones a, a less frequent or secondary fuel. Same with lactate. Lactate is a fuel um, that ought to be a topic of its own metabolic classroom. Um, but uh, these are uh, the, the general fuels of the body. And they're all competing to get burned. When alcohol comes in, it kind of demands priority boarding. It's that obnoxious passenger passenger who cuts right to the front of the line. And so everything behind has to wait uh, in order to be burned. And so the glucose levels start to climb. The fat levels start to climb in the body, all because if ethanol has come in the system, it has demanded priority boarding on this metabolic bus. What this then manifests as, and this is largely why ethanol results in such um, heavy uh, fat accumulation within the liver. Um, so here we have this um, lipid accrual. Now, um, what you're thinking, it, those of you who tuned in to the previous energy toxicity lecture is you're thinking, well, just storing more fat isn't a cause of insulin resistance. If you're thinking that, you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right. There are abundant studies to show that just having a tissue store more triglycerides, which, which is the form of fat storage, does not cause insulin resistance, even in the liver. So fatty liver isn't a cause of insulin resistance. There are distinct experiments to show this and prove it, in my mind, beyond any doubt. The same would go here. Now you're then wondering, well, Dr. Bickman, why are you even bringing it up then? Because there is still, if you do have an accumulation of lipid combined uh, or fatty acids combined with um, uh, inflammatory markers, which we're going to get to in just a second, then you do have a scenario, a metabolic milieu that is going to be stimulating ceramide accrual. And then we get back to, rather than the idea of energy toxicity, which I generally reject, we do come to this idea of lipotoxicity, where there is a very highly bioactive lipid, particularly the sphingolipid ceramides, rather than the inert glycerolipid triglycerides. So triglycerides are not a cause of insulin resistance. However, ceramides are. So this whole idea of substrate competition does explain why the body is getting loaded with higher glucose, higher fats, higher fat stored in tissues like the liver, which is the main tissue that's metabolizing the ethanol in the first place. This starts to explain some of that.
But remember also, we have the high insulin and my lab has published previously that if it, um, with this substrate competition idea in mind, uh, the ethanol is demanding priority boarding, the carbs are going to start to rise, the insulin rises and an increase in insulin, high elevated insulin does stimulate ceramide biosynthesis causing insulin resistance. So even though fatty liver disease is linked with insulin resistance, I am not one to say that it causes the insulin resistance. It's just that the, the overall metabolic scenario that's causing the fatty liver disease is also causing insulin resistance.